Okay, so we're carrying on tonight looking at um, the need of rescue, what we need to be rescued from. I've got my own rescue story which I'll add into the mix. So I don't actually remember it myself. I was only two at the time. I've heard the stories, heard the rumours go around. When I was two years old, my parents uh, and my grandparents couldn't find me. They couldn't find where I was. Uh, so they went searching around, trying to find me. Eventually they went into the back garden. Uh, there was a ladder that had been left up. And as a two-year-old, I climbed up the ladder uh, onto the roof. Um, and I, as you can imagine, me as a two-year-old, I was pretty oblivious to the dangers. I was probably just a little happy fellow enjoying, enjoying the view. But mum and mum and dad obviously were pretty worried. So dad to climb up the ladder, rescue me, take me down, uh, and bring me to safety. But as a two-year-old, I was pretty happy. I was pretty oblivious to the dangers around me. So you've already, already been challenged. Can you think of a situation yourself where you're in a similar situation where you really need a rescue, but been completely oblivious to your need to be rescued? So last night, didn't we? We looked at the the angels, and they were telling us, uh, announcing to the shepherds um, that a saviour, a rescuer, is going to be born. Uh, he's coming into the world, and this this saviour, this Jesus, was going to rescue all people. But tonight we say we need to really explore together, looking through the passage that we were reading on there, the account that we just read, of what Jesus was going to rescue us from. Um, the passage that we read, the account that we read, gives us the answer, okay? Gives us the answer of what we need to be rescued from. But we're going to have to work together tonight to investigate what it is, okay? You're going to have to work hard with me tonight. Okay, so here's the context of events. Jesus, he burst onto the scene, right? He is... Teaching, his teaching is amazing. He's already been healing people, doing amazing miracles. He's drawing crowds. So, if you have ever seen the MCG test match, a crowd building there, so that's up on the screen. If you've ever seen an MCG test match, you imagine the crowds building there or the Australian Open. Crowds building, a bit of a buzz about the place, but they're coming to see the cricket. They're coming to see the cricket, they're coming to the se see the tennis. In this situation though with Jesus, they're not coming to see cricket, they're coming to see Jesus heal people. And here, sorry, here again, yeah, here is teaching. Okay, so that's what the crowds are now gathering for. And in our story tonight, we've got a paralyzed man being brought by his friends to Jesus. We don't know too much about these guys from the story, but we know one thing. We know they're pretty determined to get their friend to Jesus. They have to burst through, drag him through a roof, lower him to the house. And it says that they, were, they had faith. They, had, they were really confident. If they brought this, their friend before Jesus, he was going to do something. And you know what? Jesus did see their faith, and he did do something, but it was not as he expected. Because what does he say? Jesus says to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Okay? On the surface, it's a real crazy situation, crazy statement. Think of this, netball. Okay? Maybe you're a really good netball player, uh, or reasonably good netball player, and you, you're really aspiring to make it to the next level. Okay? You, make it, you might want to make the state team or something. So you hear another, you go to a club, so you hear another club's got this really good coach, and you're like, I want to go and be in that club and get coaching from that coach. Because if I go to that coach, he'll help me get to the next level. So you do, you move, in, move to your next club, go along, uh, first training session, you maybe, you know, my netball skills aren't great, but maybe you have a practice at your shooting or something, coach is looking at you, you know she's looking at you, so you're like, ah, uh, I better, you know, wonder she's going to tell me. She just makes a step, she wanders across to you, and you're thinking, oh, she's going to tell me something that's going to change my game. And turn it around. And you know what she does? She comes up to you and she goes this. She shows you a banana. And you're going to be like, what? What do you mean? You, you, you give me a banana. I want to know something about my shooting. I want to be a better netball player. Well, you know what? This coach, she knows this stuff and she knows that lots of teenage players don't get their diet right. Unless you get your diet right, your nutrition right, then you're not going to be able to train. So you've got to sort that out. So that's why she gives you a banana. And so it's a bit similar with what Jesus is going on about here, because everyone, giving his track record, remember he's healing people, teaching and he's drawing these crowds, and he's brought a paralyzed man before him. So everyone expects, given his track record, for him to tell them, tell this man to get up and walk. But he doesn't, does he? What does he say? He says, his sins are forgiven. 
And he's, you know, Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't ignore the fact that the paralyzed man wants to be able to walk. But he sees that this man has a greater need. He sees um, that Jesus, Jesus sees that this man actually needs his greatest need in life met, which is the forgiveness of sins. Now, John, I mentioned sin this morning. Uh, we're going to have to really work hard now, so come with me as we unpack what this means. What does sin mean? Now, as we do this, I've got a question for you, okay? The question in a minute, you're going to answer yes or no by sticking your hand up. Uh, and this is to help us explore what sin is, okay? So, who would say that cheating in sport is a sin? Okay, hands up, you say yes. Hands up, you say no. I thought that, I thought that might happen. So, thanks for backing me up. <laughs> so, most of us would. We would say that cheating is a sin, but we might not really think why, okay? So, let's, here we go, let's work out what sin is. So, in the Bible, in the New Testament, the original kind of sense of the word sin is this idea of missing the mark or missing the goal, okay? So here's the definition. Sin, we're going to work with tonight, sin is missing the point that God created us. And so we live life without recognising that he made us. Sin is missing the point that God created us. And so we live life without recognising that he made us. So some of the symptoms of not recognising that God has made us. Okay, so maybe you go to a doctor, a little side note, you go to a doctor and you try and, you might have a sniff on your nose, or you go, doctor, doctor, what's wrong with me? And he says, oh, these, these are my symptoms. And, and actually, what is the, the heart issue going on? Well, he says, oh, you've got this virus or this virus. So you've got some symptoms, but you've also got a little cause going on. This is the same going here. So this, the, the heart of the issue of sin is that we forget that God has created us. But when we do that, the symptoms of this, and the Bible says it's this, when we don't recognise that God has made us, there's lies, there's cheating, there's deception, there's gossip, there's hatred, there's envy, there's self-hate, there's sexual immorality, there's jealousy, there's greed, there's rage, there's selfishness. They're things that no one wants to stick their hand up and say, I want to have, have that in my life. But that is the result. Those are the symptoms of turning from God. That is what sin is. So you see, if we each in the room, if we do actually acknowledge that God has made us, we'll quickly see, it doesn't take long, we'll quickly see when we look around the room that God's given us different abilities. We've all here got some measure of sporting ability, some of us more than others. Other, others of us have... We haven't maybe seen it so much. Maybe we did see it at dinner time with the piccolo going. But some of us have more musical ability. Some people actually know what a piccolo is. Um, so some people have more musical ability. Some people might be really good at leading people, getting people together. Some people might be have a real good sense of humour. Uh, some people are really good socially drawing people together. Um, what else? Some people have got really good insight. Some people have a great sense of humour. We all have different gifts that we've been given. And God has given each of us a different set of gifts that make us unique. And one of the joys of being young, right, is that you grow up, and you test yourself, and you try and work out who you are, what your gifts are, what you're good at, and who you can become. And it's the same in sport, right? In sport, the same joy is that you come up against an opponent, you test each other's skills, push each other, see who's, who's better, see if you can beat someone in a one-on-one, -on -one. and that's the exhilarating thing of sport, when you come and test those skills, and test the abilities that God has given you. But, okay, remember we're trying to answer the why is, why is cheating sin? Things turn nasty in sport when we forget that God has made us and given us the abilities. We forget that he's given us those abilities and he's given us limitations to those abilities. So we cheat. Why? Often because we can't accept that someone else is better than us. They might have pulled off an amazing skill. Maybe they've you know, bowled as well a great ball snicked you up. Maybe you've made a good interception. Maybe you, someone's just quicker than you beat you off the mark. So you try and stop them looking good by maybe giving them a nudge as they go by. Maybe pulling their shirt if they're faster than you. Or maybe you call the ball uh, in, uh, sorry, out when you knew it was in. So when we cheat in sport, we forget 
And sometimes it's willingly, sometimes we willingly do it. We forget that God has made us. We forget that he's made both me and my opponent. And he's given us both sporting ability. You see, when we don't acknowledge that God has given us these abilities with limits, we buy into a lie that we can um, be something more than God has made us to be. We buy into this lie, so we try and make ourselves look better by pulling the opponent down, pulling someone else down, rather than celebrating what they've given, they've done and achieved. So that's where we're getting this. It's a solid thought tonight as we realise and we wrestle with what goes on in our hearts. And I really challenge you each, as you go through Team Challenge this week, if you are tempted or you do end up cheating, have a think, what is actually going on inside my heart? How does this relate to the way I'm relating to God and what He thinks about me? So come back to it. We're trying to figure out what sin is. So when, when we say sin, these days, when you hear it maybe at school, I don't know if you hear it at school, or you hear it in the media, sin is this word that is now often thrown out as a, a forbidden pleasure, something you can just giggle about, have a bit of a laugh about. But what we're thinking about tonight, sin should bring a far more som somber response, a far more serious response, because sin is missing the point, it's missing the point that God created us. So we end up living a life without recognising that he made us. The sin at its heart is betrayal against God. See, instead of being thankful to God for how he's made us and what he has given us, we pretty much stick our finger up at God and we do whatever we want and whatever we can uh, to try and be someone on our own. And ultimately that, the Bible says, deserves God's wrath. God's anger, God's right anger. He's rightly angry because you have betrayed him at your heart. That is what sin is. So it's not something that can just be given away. So come back to our story, our account of what uh, Jesus is doing with this paralyzed man. See, Jesus looks at this paralyzed man, and if I paraphrase it, he's effectively saying this. Paralyzed man, I see, I see that you are paralyzed. And it's not good. It's not good that you're paralyzed. But you know what? I see something in you that is far more damaging to your health and well-being. I see that ultimately in your life, you haven't got God. You haven't got your relationship right with God, with the very one you, you, who created you. You've betrayed him. And the consequence of this is eternal separation from God. And ultimately, it's death. It's hell. See, if you're in that position, paralyzed man, you're in a desperate state of needing God's forgiveness. You need to be forgiven because you betrayed God. And your betrayal against God is far more serious than the fact that you can't walk. If you're not forgiven, you're going to continue to be separated from God, from the one who made you. And, and this is far more agonizing, paralyzed man, than being paralyzed and not being able to walk. Do you see what he's saying? It's massive. It's massive because everyone wants to go to walk. We, we love running. We're sporty. And this guy can't walk. And he desperately wants to walk. And Jesus is coming back and saying, actually, I see something far more important in your life. Okay. So we've worked hard to work out what sin is. We've worked out that Jesus is why he's saying that. There's one more dilemma that's come up that we'll touch on. You can look more in your huddle group tonight. So I wonder if you've seen the dilemma. You see, if Jesus, if our de definition of sin, we take our defini uh, definition of sin, which is ultimately that we're betraying God by not acknowledging that he's made us, well, then the only one who can forgive that is God himself, right? It's a bit like this. If you go to a, a mate, and, and maybe even this week it happens, maybe you lie or really hurt someone, you can't then go to your auntie, right? You can't go to your auntie and ask forgiveness. Right? For your hurt your friend, you have to go to the one that you've offended to ask forgiveness. And this is really what the thinking is going through through the crowds who are watching Jesus say to this man, Your sins are forgiven. See, if we look back in our Bible reading, verse 21, the Pharisees say that it says this the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began 
thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But God alone. See, they were saying that Jesus was speaking blasphemy, something, a word that we might not use too much these days. Essentially, um, they realized that by, by claiming to forgive the paralyzed man's sins, Jesus was claiming to be God. That was another issue that was going on. So, okay, so, okay, let's work with where we've got to. So, by forgiving the paralyzed man's sins, Jesus was claiming to be God. Okay, fair enough. Anyone can make a claim. You could actually probably make that claim now to the person sitting next to you. Any mad person could claim to effectively be God if that's what Jesus is doing. But if Jesus was God, then this has massive consequences. But we've got questions now. Hopefully these questions are ticking in the mind. How does actually, if Jesus made a claim, how does he actually prove to be God in this account? How does he prove that he has the ability to forgive sins? He said it, but how does he prove it? Indeed, we haven't even covered it now. Well, what does what is forgiveness? I'm not gonna we're not gonna go into them now, but there's something you can talk about a bit more with your huddle groups. We're gonna close now. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you back to my story. Remember my story? I started with me as a two-year-old, climbing up a ladder, oblivious to the dangers around me. See, I was unaware as a two-year-old of my need of rescue. And similarly in our account tonight, the onlookers to the paralyzed man, they were oblivious to this paralyzed man's greatest need. His need of forgiveness, betraying God, the forgiveness of his sins. And you know what, tonight it's no different for us in the room. You, you, no one in this room is paralyzed. It's great, you can all walk and enjoy your bodies and run. But you see, each of us in this room, you've got desires in your heart, I know it. You're young, you've got dreams, you've got things that are going on in your life. You've got desires, you might want to make the state team in this sport. Maybe one day you want to play professional sport. Maybe you've got some health issues that you need. You're asking, you know, you may be praying even at the moment, asking God for help. With. Maybe one day you want to get married. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that's broken. Maybe a relationship with your parents is broken. And you know what? God hears these prayers. He hears them. He may not answer them the way you want them to, but He answers them with perfect love, perfect wisdom. But you know what? We can, this is what we get from our account tonight. God is ultimately concerned about your relationship with Him. He's ultimately concerned with that, not your life circumstances. That's what this, the Bible is, is speaking to us tonight. Um, you can see it with this paralyzed man, right? So Jesus didn't discount the man's need to be healed, but he saw his greatest need, forgiveness of sins. And he restored his relationship with God. And you, you know what he did next? Then he did heal him, didn't he? If you remember the story, he healed him. Jesus heals him. So he forgives him and then he lovingly heals him. So he doesn't forget the need, but he deals with his main need first, his ultimate need.